Hello everybody, this is Kate Wakelam here from Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia and it's Friday again which means that it's time for our weekly um, Facebook Friday broadcast which we do every week into our private discussion group um, here at Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia to um, address the topic of the week and, and really help answer questions as they come up. So as I said I'm Kate Wakelin, I'm the Net Patient Support Nurse and you will be able to see that I've got a guest with me, um, hopefully you can see that on your screen too and um, I will be be introducing John Layden to you in just a moment but before I do I just want to take this opportunity to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I am broadcasting to you from which is the land of the Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nation and just taking this opportunity to pay my respects to elders past present and emerging. This morning I actually had a lovely chance to um, hop out early and go for a walk along the Yarra River which in the Wadarung language is called the Bitterung um, and that's a a deeply significant location for the Indigenous owners of the land and I'm very lucky and grateful to be able to share in that. So um, I'm not going to talk very much about updates about COVID because we're actually going to be addressing um, probably the, the biggest burning topic about that um, actually in our Facebook Friday. So I'm going to launch right in and introduce Dr. John Layden. And John, I'm so grateful to you for joining. Um, and uh, we had a few little technical hitches, as is the way with Zoom and, and live events. And so um, thank you for being patient and persevering with all of that stuff. John, I'm just wondering if we could start by, um, I should say, John is an anesthesiologist. Um, but uh, I, I would like, John, to actually, uh, for you to introduce yourself and to tell the people watching how it is that you've come to be associated with Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia. Well, uh, thank you for having me, Kate. And obviously, we've known each other a long time. And I will give you the abridged version. For many of you, you do know me. Um, I've been involved with NETS for over a decade. Uh, of probably 15 years. Uh, my first experience was with my late sister, Kate. I'm the only doctor in the Leyden family and I am related to Simone, the older brother, um, not husband. Um, and back in when my sister was diagnosed, uh, it was an extremely uh, tumultuous and time. We're talking in the mid 2000s uh, when I first found she had metastatic pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer with spread throughout her liver bone and the like. As the only doctor, uh, you know, uh, my wife, who's also a doctor, we went straight into action and lobbied and worked hard to get Kate every possible treatment from uh, here and around the world, getting to see world experts, Shell Oberg, Richard Warner in New York, and during that time, I lobbied drug companies for new and novel drugs, um, lobbied for Lutate, lobbied everything. So that experience over five years made me realise that Kate had a good quality of life. She had very advanced disease at diagnosis. She had a, a very supportive family, obviously, Simone and the rest of our brood. And she had a doctor who was out there at every turn getting drugs at Sunidinu. That wasn't even thought of back then. It was very novel. But I lobbied, went straight to the drug company and got, got drugs for it. So she survived probably five to six years longer than expected. And, you know, Professor Hicks would always vouch for that. You know, we did everything for Kate. Um, and it was at around the late 2000s, uh, 2009, that I realised, well, Kate was lucky just by chance being born into her family with someone who could do that. And there was thousands upon thousands of Australians who may not have access to what she had. And, uh, you know, therefore I approached a number of oncologists here in Sydney and Melbourne who I knew, including Michael Michael, and said, what do we need? I'm keen to start something to help people with NET. Um, anyway, so there it goes. Uh, I worked hard to develop the you know, constitution and, and started up with family and friends, including Simone, obviously, uh, in the early days, we all rallied around to create the Unicorn Foundation, which was a name that I, I did uh, first 
coined for this organization, which I still love and am fond of, but we've evolved over a decade or more, greatly to the greatly, well, very thankful with all the volunteers we've had. We're a small but nimble organization. Kate Wakelin, obviously, when she came on as a net nurse after a few other net nurses in between, or one particularly, um, was phenomenal, has been a phenomenal change, but also the leadership of Simone taking on the CEO role. My sister gave up her work a number of years back and has led the organization admirably. So during that time, uh, yeah, I was involved in the startup of the International Neuroendocrine Cancer Alliance as the first president. And, and uh, so I've been involved uh, for decades, or for a decade, um, and fortunately have been able to drop back a little bit due to the, the robustness of our organisation and the knowledge and support we have through our team now um, to step away a little. And, and we're in great hands with uh, our leadership team, our CEO, Kate, and and... Meredith and um, the rest. So it, it's been phenomenal. Um, I guess one of the highlights, and this is the what I'll end on, is for many of you who don't know, it took years of lobbying governments here in New South Wales and others uh, to get lutate for you, to get sinitidib and um, timazolamide, uh, Sanderstatin and all that on the PBS. So I think for a, for a small organisation, we have definitely batted above our um, average for the last 10 years. And, and really much of the stuff that new patients who are diagnosed now take for granted, um, uh, we're a long time coming. So, and I, I'm very proud of that. And just to reassure you all, um, Australia is one of the best places to be if you do suffer nets. We do have everything here at our disposal. 15 years ago, we looked overseas, but no longer do we need to. We have some of the world's leading experts here. And fortunately, we've got access to virtually every treatment we need currently. So there you go. Thanks, John, and, and what a fantastic introduction. I'm actually really excited to welcome you to Facebook Friday. Um, we've had Simone in a few times, um, and it's nice to meet another family member, I think, for everybody. So um, I can see there's heaps of people watching, which is exciting, and just encourage you all um, to put your questions for John in the comments, um, knowing, and I've already discussed this with John today um, earlier when we were talking about what we might cover and the sorts of questions that have been submitted so far and we agreed fairly early on in that conversation that um, there might need to be a part b uh, because uh, you know i guess if we ask an anesthesiologist a, a, a medical question we're probably not going to get a, a two second answer these things are often really complex especially when we're talking about nets um, so the reason the, the key reason that the, the initial reason why um john and I, I i wanted to approach you and thank you so much for coming along to this um uh was really around the conversations in our facebook private discussion group related to the covid19 vaccines um there were some early reports of rare but serious allergies to the, to um the particular the pfizer vaccine but knowing that really any vaccination carries with it a risk of allergy and anaphylaxis particularly. And that sparked a conversation in our group because people with NETSA frequently, especially if they have severe carcinoid syndrome, are advised not to have adrenaline. You know, if you're having dental work or, um, a, you know, a local anaesthetic somewhere, it's best not to inject adrenaline because we know that that can, in rare instances, um, stimulate a cascade of hormones and make people very sick and that's called carcinoid crisis. So I was, I, I was wanting to get John because John, you, you've been very, very generous with this expertise over the years, but you're frequently called upon to provide comment about the management of carcinoid crisis. And the reason for that is that because of your profession, being an anesthesiologist and particularly um, in the cardiac area, this is something that, that does come up. Um, and with your personal interest too. So I wanted to grill you about the COVID vaccine specifically, but actually more generally, I remember I had a patient question about 12 months ago where that patient discovered they had an anaphylactic reaction to bee stings and they were a bee farmer of all things. And so he was saying, well, 
you know, what about if I get stung? Do I use my EpiPen? You know, I'm regional, of course, because complicated things always happen in the country. What if I have an anaphylactic reaction, have my EpiPen, that sorts out the anaphylaxis, but then I stimulate a carcinoid crisis. What's going to be more tricky for the ambulance to manage? All of those questions. And so I thought, oh, I think I need to phone a friend and get John into a Facebook Friday and he can help us sort of unpack some of this stuff. So I wondered if that's an okay place to start, John. And then there are questions from people that where they submitted around things like someone's having a, um, oh, I've lost the, that's interesting. I've lost the little list of um, questions to ask, which I'll get back up on the screen. Um, I might have to be relying on my memory. Um, uh, but I know I've given them to you, John. Um, uh, let's, let's start with the vaccine stuff and then, yeah, there is someone having a colonoscopy. Well, well, let's go. Sorry, Katie. Thank you. There's a lot there. And uh, the water is muddied, so let's try and clear it a little. Let's go back. Anaphylaxis is a life-threatening disease if not managed properly. Carcinoid, albeit um, significant with changes in blood pressure, heart rate, everything, may not kill you, all right? It probably doesn't. It doesn't. Well, I've seen carcinoid crisis many times. We can manage it. But untreated anaphylaxis is a killer, whereby hypotension, cardiac arrest, severe bronchospasm or asthma, you know, if left untreated, we have deaths, okay? So I think we've got to prioritise what is most important? Anaphylaxis needs to be treated, and we can treat that. Anaphylaxis is caused by proteins or peptides that stimulate our, uh, let's say, immune system, for the want of a better word, or particularly mast cells. These are circulating cells in our blood. They're found also in our skin, et cetera, et cetera, which causes a fulminant or widespread release of vasodilatory, that is uh, hormones and, and chemicals, particularly histamine. Um, and when uh, you say vasodilatory, that means there's, you're opening up the blood vessels. So yeah, so you, uh, the, the classic uh, signs are rash or hives, uh, asthma or bronchospasm, which is histamine causes that. Um, in the old days, we would challenge asthmatics with a histamine inhale, uh, inhaled histamine. Um, and more tragically, when we call vasodilation, it's mainly the veins and the arteries open up, become leaky pipes, fluid gushes out, you know, not blood, but out of the veins and arteries into the tissue, your blood pressure drops. If your blood pressure drops, you can't feed the, the heart with oxygen and blood. Or oxygen per se and your heart you know goes into funny rhythms and that's it now as a cardiac anesthetist i don't see this daily but i can ha manage it we do have sick hearts um so that therefore needs to be treated and for all of you listening the got and i'm a part of very close to the allergy clinic at royal north shore one of our leading anesthetic and uh, perioperative allergy clinics we had a massive anaphylaxis on Wednesday, where I was in the operating theatre, um, where a little lady had amoxicillin, she was being tested and bang. The next thing is she, you know, uh, was having adrenaline and CPR. Now, very unusual. We've never seen that in 10, 10 15 years, but just as she survived with adrenaline. Epinephrine, adrenaline, whatever you want to call it, is the gold standard, even in carcinoid, okay? That's the take home message, the treatment of anaphylaxis, adrenaline, adrenaline, adrenaline. Therefore, the treatment of car carcinoid crisis, and currently, and I don't know if there is a lot of questioning of the use of adrenaline in carcinoid and whether or not we should be avoiding it. You know, is it really the biggest trigger that we ever thought, or can it be used? And I'll come back to that maybe later today or another day. I have used it in carcinoid. I have used noradrenaline in carcinoid. I have used vasopressin, all these very big drugs in, intraoperatively, and I've 
been able to guide patients at Royal North Shore or other anaesthetists with the management. So first of all, first take home message, in an anaphylactic event, adrenaline should be used. Okay, that will save your life. So the beekeeper with an EpiPen, first of all, make sure you're very well covered when you're uh, <laughs> tending to your honey. Uh, the idea is to avoid getting stung, but if you get stung and you start to feel that reaction, that allergic reaction, be it full anaphylactic or the spectrum between, maybe a little rash or a bit of asthma or a bit of lightheaded, use your EpiPen. That's, that's the take home message. So anaphylaxis it equals adrenaline, two A's, just, just think of that. When it comes to vaccines, vaccination is a preventative measure for life-threatening illnesses. We've been vaccinated all of us as children, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, um, and for those old enough, you know, they may have friends in their generation who had polio, who are still walking with limps and what have you. So we need, but vaccination is for prevention. It's not a treatment. We all need to be vaccinated to ensure that these very significant diseases are not spread through the community causing uh, widespread illness and obviously, um, to, you know, increased demands on health care resources. So the anti-vaxxers, if you're in the room, please listen. Um, I'm for vaccination, okay? I'm not for unwarranted panic created by media. And we do see it daily on your 24-hour feeds. And as net patients, we are extremely, we come to nets anxious. And that is because oftentimes we've had nets for a long time and no one's known what they're doing. So we don't have a lot of trust in the system because we've been unwell for a while. And therefore, unless you speak to an expert, people roll their eyes and go, I don't know, I, I, I've never heard of it. I only read two lines of it in Harrison's medical textbook. So nets, we are vigilant and we're sometimes uh, a suspicious so to speak so and that's that's okay um but with vaccines we all some of you have already had vaccines when you had nets without knowing you had nets okay remember that you might have had flu vaccines before you were diagnosed and without adverse sequelae or adverse outcomes so remember that so we've got to create a perspective i would rather you have a flu vax rather than get full-blown influenza A, it, that can be a killer. You know, you can get heart disease, you can get cardiomyopathies, you can, you can get very unwell, chronic fatigue, you know, long-term immunological uh, disease processes from a bad influenza infection. So um, vaccines, I think, are totally appropriate for all our net patients with regard to a few things. First of all, I, I can speak wholeheartedly. I've had the two Pfizer jabs. My wife, is, uh, who's also medical, has had the AstraZeneca and is waiting for a second, of which we've also discussed and thought, oh my God, you know, central uh, venous thrombosis. Um, you know, she's a radiologist, so she's seen it before. So she, we worry about that, but we will go ahead. Um, knowing the very, very small risk in a healthy woman, what that will be, particularly having had a first dose. So I had a reaction, minor, and we would all expect to have a reaction. So if you were to go for a vaccine, my advice would be, like in Sydney, we have centres such as uh, Hubs, Liverpool Hospital, Westmead, in consultation with your GP or oncologist, I would go to a central or a hospital hub rather than a GP situation. I would accept the vaccine. I don't think they're, you know, between AstraZeneca and Pfizer or the Moderna or whatever, I think we should have one of them. Um, if I was to say to have one, maybe the Pfizer, you know, again, for the rare 
the one in 500,000 chance of a, a blood clot, but I think that would be up to your oncologist and GP. And I think currently only the AstraZeneca, of which if you know, if some of you realise, most of the UK has been uh, immunised with the AstraZeneca rather than the Pfizer. So re remember 61, oh, what, 16, oh, hang on, 61 million in the UK? I don't know. But a lot have been vaccinated with that without um, incident. So if you have a chronic disease of which net is, um, I would suggest rather than having it in your local GP's office, speak frankly and openly with them and or your oncologist and see if you can be booked in to a hospital hub. And in that respect, you do have greater resources. Having gone through it, it was beautifully streamlined at Westmead, one of the best things they've ever done, even though it's underfunded and probably a bit <laughs> run down. Um, but uh, questionnaires are given, um, you are monitored, the vaccine um, app, they send you a link to ask questionnaires afterwards. And again, unless you had unstable disease, that is you were not on an octreotide depot preparation or you know, which most people are as it's the mainstay. Of so, so, sorry, translating. So that's sandostatin or manreotide, just for those who might be newer to the scene. <laughs> um, sorry, I'll just say. Yeah, have a drink. Everyone else can catch their breath too, because it's it's good information. And thank you. Oh, sorry. I'll just keep. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, keep going. Keep, keep talking. Right. Unless uh, you are unstable disease, obviously you weigh the risks and balances. You need to be stabilised a little prior to. And now we don't have any evidence of this. Remember, we don't have uh, studies showing this. But it's for me, it's more common sense. What would I do if I felt this way? I would wait. Obviously, you, you try and avoid people so you don't get the COVID, disease, COVID um, uh, virus. And fortunately, in Australia, we have low rates currently. So we are very, very lucky. So you've got a little, you've got time, I'm saying. Um, but when you go, when you are to have it, and I would encourage you, um, hospital situation and Remember, you will probably have a reaction, minor as it is. Healthy people have minor reactions. I would go when I'm as healthy as possible, you know, stable as possible, no recent coughs, colds or flus, uh, no recent chemo treatments. So you, you would try and avoid those going close to periods where your immune system has been uh, impacted. So if you are on capecitabine, temozolomide or something, you try and time it where there is a period where your body has recovered more. John, that, oh, sorry. So, and that includes ensuring your nutrition's well, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're feeling better. So can I ask you about the timing around somatostatin analog injections? Because a few people have emailed me about that. Um, uh, we know that somatostatin analogs don't really play very much with the immune system. So it's, you won't be immune depleted after an injection in the same way that you might be with chemotherapy. But is there an advantage to having, if you're worried about allergies uh, and carcinoid syndrome and potentially carcinoid crisis, is it better to have your immunization where, you know, a week after your butt jab you know, can you comment answer. about the timing? I think you know answered that, Kate. You've already answered it. Uh -huh. uh -huh. There's a Dorothy Kate, Kate is right, and she's very knowledgeable, so please always heed her words. Um, it is true, depot preparations, they slowly um, release the octreotide, you know, in their formulation, whatever, lanreotide, sandstone. Um, and we know they, uh, not peak, but, you know, five to seven days afterwards, between seven days after or five days after your injection and nearing the end of your month, you know, so maybe four to five days before your next injection is the ideal window. Um, we still try and do that for surgery, you know, and, and other interventions, time it with your lanreotide, sandostatin, or I'm just going to say octreotide long-acting, um, octreotide long-acting preparations. We do have that window of two and a half to three weeks where ideally, you know, common sense dictates our receptors are 
blocked by the octreotide and our tumours are being modulated, downgrade, their activity is downgraded. Remember the, so yes. That, that, sorry, I was going to say, can we extrapolate from that um, other things that we're worried about, you know, for, and I know there are people in our community with really unstable carcinoid syndrome where, you know, they sneeze and they have a hot flush. Um, other things that feel a bit more risky but are still necessary is it can we extrapolate from that that maybe that sort of five to seven days after your injection leading up to sort of you know four or five days before the next one's going to be the best time to do those things physiologically that's what we can extrapolate however physiology is one thing but how everyone responds is different and this is the the crazy thing about prediction or risk stratification of car people having carcinoid syndromes. Sometimes the most, let's say, um, that's what I'm thinking of, not ad, um, unstable, um, sensitive, let's say you, you do sneeze and get a red uh, and get a flush. You may fly through it. You know what, it doesn't correlate having hot flushes daily or six loose bowel actions daily when you're on you know obviously we do titrate the long-acting octreotide to disease symptoms such as you know bowel actions or flushing and that so you may need higher doses but even at good doses um, that still may not pre uh, predispose you to a full-blown carcinoid crisis do you know what i mean you have i think trusting that we are blocked um, some patients who are asymptomatic actually have the worst carcinoid crisis when stimulated, you know, so. Oh, okay, so an asymptomatic, just for those watching at home, means oh, having sorry. no carcinoids. I'm going to pull you up on every little medical jargon that I pick up, John, sorry, I'll be rude. Um, but I, I know that there are people who haven't had any medical training and are new to the scene, so they'll be like, asymptomatic, what does that mean? Um, so, yeah. yeah, no symptoms of carcinoid mm. syndrome. And that is the vexatious and frustrating thing for us, um, medically who are treating nets and also more so for patients because they would like to be able to categorically say dot 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 i you know and i think remember you we live with this disease and every patient uh you must document and, and think about your disease what triggers things what uh makes it worse what makes you feel better and and those are very important things to convey to your your uh, physician or, um, or your doctor and convey at the time of anything now again if you're concerned it's all about communication and it's about allaying your own anxiety and uh recent so yeah uh what i'm saying is currently in the literature the only thing that may have had a small link towards predisposing to carcinoid crises are being on an anti-hypertensive, a lower, a blood pressure lowering medication. Now that that is wasn't a, a full powered, that means that the direct linkage wasn't strong, but there's a sense that if you are on blood pressure tablets, maybe we'd be a bit more careful, a bit more wary about carcinoid crises in you. But but again, it's a it's it, it's not a direct corollary. <laughs> um, so, but again, that would be the only thing, you know. And again, learning your own symptoms and learning to trust your body, and then you're able to tell that to a doctor and they will understand. I think that's really important. Don't expect them to understand what triggers what happens. Um, I think you saying, well, you know, in general, I'm feeling okay. I do have symptoms, that is, you know, symptoms of carcinoid, but I will go about my daily activities without massive, you know, crises, okay? I think we've got to move away. A crisis is, is a not insignificant event, whereas symptoms we can carry with, um, I know they're awful, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they're easy, but uh, we are different to a crisis. So, and they don't walk hand in hand. Yep, then that's probably important for me to take on board because I think I have probably linked the two things in the past as well. So I love the fact that when we get a guest on Facebook Friday, it's not just me talking, but I actually get to really listen and learn as well, which is exciting. John, there's two questions that I have. Um, 
further about the vaccine if we can and and i'm going to take you up on your offer to come back another time because there is oh, so sorry. much more um we're okay it's 138 in oh no no something popped up on my silly computer i'll um i'm getting i've lost oh, you. they pick they pick the time oh. where you're being <laughs> broadcast to the world oh there you are Back. You are? We're, we're yeah. back? Okay. So the first question was relating to a comment you made when we were talking on the phone this morning about anxiety um, and carcinoid syndrome. Um, so I wondered if you could give us a little bit of a comment about that because I was just sort of, you know, saying we were talking about the, I guess, the level of anxiety in the general community about these vaccines, um, which we wouldn't have. We, we don't, oh, well, I don't think we had the same level of anxiety. Um, the same level of anxiety when we're talking about the flu vaccine or you know whatever um uh the other question i had was around pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas and i'm springing this one right on you because i didn't even think about it until now but i realized that we've got members of our um pheo and para community who are joining us today and um we've talked very much just about carcinoid syndrome and not about adrenal um function so i we can take that on notice if that is something that you want to come back to on another week. Um, um, I, we, we will come. I'm happy to discuss that further, um, particularly para, because I pray to God that you've had your fear removed before you do anything, you know. So um, uh, most patients with FEOs, even if it's part of a, you know, um, MEN or a, it's part of FEO paraganglioma, will hopefully... Um, have addressed the removal of most of that fair chromocytoma. Um, obviously, having an active FEO would preclude most things, and we need to treat the blood pressure, treat the patient, and prepare them for surgery to remove that, that tumour that is secreting excessive amounts of noradrenaline and adrenaline, you know. So I guess um, that, that, that's, that, that is probably a contraindication, active FEO. But if you have had surgery, um, and had FEOs removed, your FEO removed, be it unilat one side or both sides. Hold on, you caught yourself. <laughs> um, and you know that your, uh, your metabolites that you measure in your urinary 5-HIA and your noradrenaline levels are down, well, of course, having a, a vaccine, again, looking at the positive or benefits of a vaccination compared to getting COVID, and I will just, uh, I have a conflict here. I did during COVID intubate five patients at Royal North Shore when I was a senior on overnights in the ICU who had very bad lung disease, uh, two had stroked. Um, again, you've got to think you don't want it. With COVID, I, you mean? You yeah, like you that. don't want to really get a full-blown COVID because we don't know who gets the really bad one where they do get clots, they do have very bad lung disease, or who gets the mild and asymptomatic disease. Even one of our anaesthetists, who I went out for two weeks because I was in contact very early on, March last year. Um, ironically, we were training to treat COVID in an operating theatre, and lo and behold, the anaesthetist standing a metre and a half away from me, the next day was COVID positive and the whole room, 15 of us went out and the whole department was decimated. We all had to go out. But she actually was not well. She was, she was a fit young 40 year old, uh, no comorbidities, that is no diabetes, hypertension and the like. Um, and she wasn't well. So that really struck me that I don't really want this uh, infection. So I'd rather be vaccinated and have a very, very one in 500,000 risk of significant side effects, which is allergy or whatever it may be, than a, a one in 10 chance of getting it and being sick, you know, or whatever it is. So you've got to, you, you do have to put it into a little perspective. If you've got a bad COVID, you don't actually do too well with it. And Especially it's when still, you've got cancer, we know. It is so. still, it's still killing people globally. So I, I, it, sometimes you kind of have to slap yourself a bit and say, stop leading, listening to the, the naysayers in the media who are going, oh, my God, oh, my God, ScoMo, you're to blame, you know, or we shouldn't have been doing this. So I think you've got to go, well, weigh it up. I don't want to... You know, if we had a, if we were India in, in, in Melbourne or Sydney or Tari or wherever you are, um, 
with lots of COVID, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd be dead scared about yeah. getting, leaving the house, you know, um, no matter what. So again, it is an appropriate thing when appropriately timed. Um, and I guess trusting yourself. And NETS is about trusting your own body eventually once you get around to it and saying, well, I'm living with this chronic disease, which gives you the shits. But literally, <laughs> uh, you don't want it. Nobody wants it. But it's about living with it and realizing um, you know a lot more about it than a lot. Ninety-five percent of the doctors you come in contact with, and therefore, being well versed, you can speak confidently and say, you know, I would like to go get a, an injection at somewhere where there's resuscit, you know, where there's a bit more support. If in the very, very rare chance, I had a reaction. You know, and I think that, and you can, you can hand on heart um, say, and if your GP goes, ah, oh, don't worry about it, you go, I would like you to document my concerns, <laughs> you know, and there it is in paper, document my concerns during this consultation. That's what I would like to do, please, you know, mm -hmm. and I think you are definitely, um, it's your right or it's, it's honestly the right thing to do. So um, I want to come back to anxiety because I've oh, yeah. preempted that question, but someone's actually just written a, a question in the in the comments, and I just thought, oh gosh, <laughs> I, I want to read it out to you. I won't be, um, I won't identify you um, because this goes up publicly. But um, someone has just said, oh John, <laughs> it's not a good start, is it? Oh John, you have created a dilemma for me. I'm midway between my first PRRT, my landreotide is due on Monday. I have an appointment to have my COVID injection on Wednesday. My vaccine will be administered at a doctor's clinic. Can now, I should say, I didn't give a disclaimer at the very beginning of the conversation, but we have alluded to it all the way along that this is a general advice only and for your own situation, please see your doctor. Um, However, any general comments for people in this sort of situation? So let's not provide individual advice to this lady, but um, or this person. Um, uh, but what's your, like, we already talked really about that, but I, I guess. A few days, so whereabouts in the, the PRT? Midway between the, first PRRT and then the Lanreotide, post PRRT is due on Monday. Given what we've discussed, you know, um, again, are we, you know, how I, I still would maybe wait a couple of days as we, you know, with the Lanrea type, because obviously we time uh, PRT when the receptors are not taken up as much with the Lanrea type. So the PRT with the, um, can bind to those receptors which aren't now occupied as we say and then the the lutetium is taken into the cell and cause its mayhem thank goodness um so again I, I think given that we don't have any numbers the urgency is not there and i would suggest a couple more days mm, just um, to bring it to that four to five days post injection and, and um uh, ask, can I be done here at Peter McCallum or are they sent, you know, uh, I don't. I happen to know this patient is actually regional, so there's oh, not a Peter right. McCallum around the corner, unfortunately. Oh, no, oh, all right. Sorry, sorry. It's or even... tricky for people in the country, I think, where there's not necessarily the same levels of choice. Yeah, no, um, that is true. Um, the other thing is doctors can, uh, will you, again, if you are regional, again, voicing your concern to your GP, they will, you know, you don't want the jab and then sent outside. Do you know what I mean? For anybody. Yeah. You know, and they made me wait. I don't know if you would have had this too, John, but I had my Pfizer vaccine uh, two weeks ago. Um, like you, sore arm, feeling a little bit dodgy the next day, but not too bad. Um, I, I hear the second Pfizer jab's a bit worse, but anyway, we'll wait. I'll report back. And, on yeah, that again, that's, that's individual. I thought I the th three of us, a cardiac surgeon, myself and another anaesthetist had it all on the Thursday. And I thought, oh, great, I might, we might cancel the list the next day. But no, we were all fine. Uh, a, bit of, a, bit, to work. <laughs> a bit of Panadol <laughs> and it was fine. But then I have heard people feel extremely crook for a couple of days, you know. Mm. So. But they make you wait. Um, I, I, at the clinic I went to, they put the time of the vaccine on a sticker on my chest and said, you know, so they, they could see 
<laughs> I think presumably if I collapsed, then they wouldn't have to be trying to ask me what time my vaccine was given. It would be written on me. And they actually made me wear that sticker around. So I went to the shops and things after that. Um, and they said, you know, keep the sticker on you for the rest of the day, just in case anything does happen that we know then what's happening. You know, but but I think this is an abundance of caution that they're doing this, but obviously waiting afterwards um, in case of a reaction. We might, we did that with flu vaccine as well. I make the wait in, in the yeah. waiting room. Get, a, a little less so, but getting back to that uh, inquiry, um, I would, if you are rural, again, uh, on balance, if you explain the situation to your trusted GP and say, you know, obviously I'm concerned, I would like to wait a couple of days further after my depot, my lanreotide, my long-acting octreotide. I've just had my PRT and I would feel more comfortable in that setting. And can I stay for, you know, X amount of time? If you were to have an anaphylaxis, it would occur within the, the first five minutes. So you, your absorption from that intramuscular injection occurs very quickly. Mm. Even when we inject under the skin, when we do allergy testing, the rash and the wheel or the, you know, uh, raised skin happens very quickly. So I think you can be assured you won't have an anaphylaxis after half an hour. So if you don't have breathing problems, significant rash, feeling faint or lightheaded or whatever, after the first 15 minutes to half an hour, really, um, hand on heart, I, you've missed the anaphylaxis. That's not to say you won't get other feeling nauseated, headachey, aches and pains over the next 24 hours as your immune system uh, recognises that this uh, vaccine is foreign and you mount a response and you start to develop your T-cells and all those things. So your body's reacting. So we all, well or with nets, will exhibit something of that over two to three days afterwards. And usually Panadol, and please, Panadol is a great drug. Only take four grams a day. So that's uh, uh, two tablets, four times. So gram of, no more than four grams, please, because it is bad on your liver. Um, but Panadol, keep the fluids up and rest. Mm. That, that would be it. I'd stay away from the anti-inflammatories, the non-steroidals, ibuprofen, um, just for the time being. Um, but you know, if you're healthy and well, I'd say either or, but just, yeah. So um, we're going to finish in a minute, but I did want oh, to... Anxiety. Yes, <laughs> if that's okay, if we can circle back to anxiety, I hate to do that to you because okay. nothing like talking about anxiety to make you feel... I'm starting to get a hot flush just thinking about it and I don't even have anything. Um, tell oh. me about anxiety and carcinoid syndrome, if that's okay. Okay. Anxiety goes hand in hand with NETS. Okay, whether or not you've got functioning disease or non-functioning disease, over 15 years of meeting net patients worldwide, I think it's a part and parcel of the disease. Um, again, because of the journey of where you've come and how you've got there and the uncertainty. Uncertainty creates anxiety, even if you weren't previously an un uncertain person. In addition, some of the hormones released by NET have given you anxiety for a long time. Mm. Okay. Given that, anxiety doesn't predispose to crisis per se because it's, it's background. It's always there. Excessive anxiety does predispose to exaggerated physiological responses. Even in my so normal... let's unpack that language. Oh, I... You said exa exaggerated physiological responses, and if I didn't have a nursing background, that might throw me. Oh. So exaggerated, so amplified, increased physiological body responses. Right, so body responses. So you're and... talking about flushing. Diarrhea. No, I'm just talking about your immune system, your um, blood pressure system. That is your sympathetic nervous system. Your all your nervous system are at heightened alert. Anxiety is the fright or flight sort of thing, but unfortunately living with it at a higher level, all your bodily systems are heightened in their response. Now, it may not predispose to carcinoid, remember that, but it does make anything that you do feel 
worse, if that makes sense. Anxiety, an ideal, you know, obviously, five days a week with anxious patients coming to surgery. And it does us no good, even a healthy young person coming for a minor procedure to be highly anxious. So the goal would be whatever our patients in our community do is try to learn to dampen down your anxiety states. And I don't talk about medication. I just say, except I am anxious, I do, I am feeling nervous, but how can I approach this calm, you know, develop strategies, be it cognitive behaviour therapy, Tai Chi, meditation. Um, you know, and we're going to come back. We're actually doing a focus on anxiety in a few weeks' time. Yeah. Um, one of the things we didn't get to talk about today um, was exercise. So we'll, we're, we're going to invite you back, John, but um, we're, we're excited at the moment because we're launching the, the COSA, the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia, clinical practice guidelines for the management of NET. So we're hoping that will help both patients, but really importantly, um, health professionals out there in the community to manage NETs more effectively. And one of the things I'm super excited about is that there is an, there is a, chapter on exercise physiology so we'll talk about that with John um uh, there's also a chapter on diet which is fantastic because it's one of the, it's the most commonly topic discussed topic um in my inquiries um and the other uh, the inquiries that come to me and the other the other um chapter that's new in these guidelines is psychosocial management um and we you know that focuses on anxiety so we're going to do a focus on anxiety on a Facebook Friday in a few weeks time um, I think we probably should leave it there. And you've got something well, to no, no, can, can I, can yeah. I, As excited as you are with those COSA guidelines, which is fantastic, but my take-home, I'll just summarise. Take-home messages, yeah. adrenaline is good for anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis will occur very quickly. So if you have your vaccine and don't have it within five, ten minutes, well, you're not, you know, you're not going, it's not going to happen. And if you do have it, an EpiPen or adrenaline is good. Um, as we talked about timing, I think based on first principles and common sense, timing of your vaccine and alerting your physician or GP of your concerns is very important. Um, and as we came all the way around to anxiety, exercise I love as an anti-anxiety mm. tool. Mm. Walk your dog. Get out of the house, walk around the block, sit in the park, stretch, do whatever. You know, you're not running a marathon, but exercise, move, 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 move. And you release so many good hormones. You do modify your immune system. You boost your immune system when you are exercising. Okay, not except people get run down if they're over exercising. Let's talk about moderate exercise, fun exercise, you know, walk with people. All those things are positive, and that I would encourage you all to take home as well. Ex moderate exercise with friends, family, dogs, whatever. It, like Kate Wakelin can attest to it. She went for a lovely walk along the Yarra today and came back feeling much better, you know. So, Exercise is good for you, even if you're suffering symptoms. Make sure you know where the toilets are on your walk. And that's the only thing I can suggest. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, John. And that was a really great summary. Um, look, I, I'm so grateful to you and um, for, you know, for spending this last hour with us, really um, unpacking some of the concerns around, particularly around the vaccine and carcinoid syndrome and carcinoid crisis. We will absolutely invite you back, please, um, to talk because I know there are lots of um, uh, uh, people who are interested in it. Like, I, I guess an update because we did do a webinar a few years ago on um, anaesthetics and surgery and um, uh, and and carcinoid. And that's what am I trying to say? I need to finish as well. Um, so uh, the link to that will be in the notes, but we'll have John back. Um, I'll, I'll tie him down to a diary date and I'll actually this time make sure I send all of the proper details through um, so that we can have him back because it's always really fantastic to you know, pick your brain. So thank you, John. Pleasure. I've had a couple of bits. Oh, sorry. Oh, so it's a pleasure. And I'm, uh, look, given we've torn the band aid off and I'm here. Um, <laughs> I'm very happy to come back more frequently. 
Fantastic. Oh, my, I'll hold you to that. Um, John, I've got a couple of bits of housekeeping news. You're welcome to stick around to listen if you'd like, but it's also fine for you to press the little red, um, you know, I need a cup of tea button. Um, and, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time if you want, you know, so whatever you like. Pleasure. Thank you, Kate. And good luck, everybody. And, you know, um, please, you know, obviously you are utilising the resources of NECA formerly known as Unicorn Foundation. Um, and yeah, please, you know, get on board and keep the support going and we'll look after each other. Take care. Thank you, John. Awesome. Okay. So I'm not going to keep you too much longer, everybody, but I did have a couple of things to say. The first thing is, Thank you so much to everybody who has filled in the support group survey. I checked in this morning, 130. I don't think I've ever put a survey out to our community and had 130 people um, give us their thoughts. And I think it only speaks strongly for the, the interest and, and I guess the gaps that not being able to meet in person has left in all of our lives. And, and I'm, I'm using a, you know, I'm using me in that too. I can't wait to be back in the same room as some of, our patients and being able to meet in person and zoom is brilliant when we can't do it uh, when we can't be there in person and, and we will continue to offer monthly zoom meetings regardless of what else we do um, but as most of you know we're hoping to um, re-establish our face-to-face -face meetings as of june we've got some planning to do we're really keen to get your feedback i think i checked on survey monkey and they said the average amount of time spent on the survey was nine minutes so it's it's you know boil the kettle <laughs> put the rubbish out it's about the same amount of time as that so really appreciate everyone has done it it's open until wednesday next week so we've just a few more days um and we, you know, this is your last chance to have your say. So thank you. Um, I'll make sure the link's in the notes. The other thing I wanted to just give a bit of a plug for was uh, lots of you will be aware that we collaborate really closely with Cancer Council in a program called Cancer Connect. This program trains volunteers who have experienced net cancer and other, all of the other cancers um, uh, to be able to provide one-to-one -one telephone peer support to people, especially those who are newly diagnosed. A lot of people when they're very new, when they're very fresh to nets, they're not ready for a whole group because they just they, they don't want to be overwhelmed by too many people's stories, but they really find it just so useful to talk to someone who's kind of, who, who's heard of neuroendocrine cancer and has sort of had to navigate some of that same pathway. So it's an incredibly highly valued, highly evaluated program. We have um, a small number of very wonderful volunteers, um, lots of whom are in our community and our Facebook private discussion group and in our support groups. We are at the process where the Cancer Council are going to do some more training uh, at the moment, we collaborate actively with two states, so New South Wales and Victoria. So Cancer Council is a federated organisation. Each individual state runs sort of semi-independently. So this collaboration is with Victoria and New South Wales. We've got, I think, um, we've got a, a couple of volunteers lined up to do the training, I think, in May, um, at the end of May, um, which is really exciting. I'm very pleased about that from the New South Wales perspective. We don't have anyone um, in Victoria yet who has put their hand up for as to be a new volunteer. Um, there are some specific situations where I know I don't, I, I, there's sort of kind of a gap in the volunteers. Um, we actually, I'd love to have a few more volunteers who have just had an operation and not needed any further treatment. Um, you know, I speak to a lot of people, for example, who've got an appendix tumour um, and they're trying to work out whether to have the right me the bigger operation to take out the surrounding section of bowel and sometimes that's a bit of a question that is given back to patients well it's probably safer to do the operation but it's a big operation with you know potential um, side effects and, and risks so uh, being able to link one of those people I don't necessarily the, the the Facebook support group might not necessarily be the right place for that person um, but a one-to-one -a -one phone conversation would be fantastic to be able to facilitate so those sorts of volunteers I could do with some more volunteers particularly in Victoria but also you know I'm open to people in New South Wales I don't think I've got anyone who's had a lung primary at the moment in our volunteer pool um, I could do with more volunteers who have had PRRT so the peptide receptor radionuclide therapy because that's a common question that people come to me with that again linking in directly with a volunteer who's 
been through that um, is, is really valuable. The other situations, there's a couple of other situations where I'm very keen to investigate. The first one is, and this was in the little ad we ran a few weeks ago on our e-newsletter and things, but um, people who have been a carer or are a carer and feel like they've got capacity. Now, the tricky thing with being a carer is that we know that's incredibly costly from an energy point of view and an emotions point of view. And sometimes you just don't have capacity, often you don't have capacity to really be supporting other people along the way. We, we, we get that. Um, however, if you are a carer or you have been a carer in the past and you feel like there is room in your, you know, you've got capacity emotionally to share parts of your story with someone who might be newer to that sort of situation, um, we know how powerful and how helpful that can be. We know that caring for someone with NETS is really different from caring with other cancers. So at the moment, I can link a carer to a carer of a different sort of can a person with a different sort of cancer. But the feedback I've had back is that it was lovely and they were really nice people and they tried their best, but they just didn't really get it because NETS is so different. So I would love to have some NET carers. Victoria is the only state that's training carers. So you, the trick is you've got to be based in Victoria if you're wanting if you're wanting to volunteer for that one the other situation is for people with um either a pheo or a para or a genetic predisposition and the genetic predisposition doesn't necessarily need to have led to the development of a net so um i'll be uh, putting a link in our pheo para facebook private discussion group as or the the I can't remember the name of that group but there is a group especially for people with pheos and paras and or and 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 there's a lot of talk about the genetic um, predispositions in that group. Um, again, when someone has, is diagnosed with MEN1 or um, SDHB or SDHD, they might not actually have developed any nets, any actual tumours, but they're living with that, um, the, the ongoing screening, um, the ongoing impact of knowing that, you know, depending on the, 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 the condition, um, there's a risk of maybe a really very high risk of developing a cancer. It might mean that you need to be having prophylactic surgery. So surgery to remove the risk of, you know, removing an organ that where we're highly expecting a net to grow. Um, navigating family discussions around testing children. Um, pre we're doing a, a session in a few weeks time about pre pre-implantation screening, which is actually an IVF process where we can, um, with the, the help of very clever scientists, screen out um, embryos that might have the genetic fault. But that is an expensive and ethically fraught process. Like there's so much going on for people with a gene situation. So I'm very keen to actually train out some volunteers who have got that diagnosis and navigated some of that stuff so that you can provide a bit more support information to people who are newer to that situation and really grappling with that impact on their own lives. So I want you to let me know if you're interested. Um, email is the best way. My contact details will be in the notes. Now, the last thing, and I've been yabbering on, which I, you know, I do. And um, so <laughs> I'm just going to keep going. There is a project which um, Simone actually posted about that in our Facebook group um, last week, but I wanted to give a reminder. And that is the, the fact is that um, nationally, the government are developing a national cancer plan, an Australian cancer plan. Um, and they, um, there is an opportunity for us to uh, really share con and contribute our stories as a, as a patient community and as people affected by NETS. So what we would, uh, what we're inviting people to do is actually make a submission to us for us to be able to use, um, to provide to the government regarding formulation of that cancer action plan and being able to help them appropriately prioritise where services and um, and things are, are, you know, the priority that things are given. Um, so what we're looking for are um, submissions regarding, and I'm looking at my other screen so you'll know I'm not looking at you. Um, we want to know about your journey from diagnosis, treatment, management. We want to know about your experience of the Australian healthcare system. And I guess that does invite reflections on where maybe things might not have gone so well or where things could improve. Um, we want to know what you think are your rights, your roles, your responsibilities in your 
um, healthcare journey. And sorry to use the cliche journey word, but it, it actually is quite a good one um, in this instance. So what are your rights and roles? You know, how much information do you want to be given? Things like, you know, I was talking yesterday to a, a um, or the day before to a, a young lady who, you know, their practice had refused to print out results. Like, but I would expect that maybe that's your right as a patient. So if that's been your experience, we want to hear about it so we can pass that information on. Have you had access to the treatments, the technologies, the clinical teams, the support teams that you know that you need? And we know that not everybody with NETS gets access to those things. Um, and, and really importantly, um, um, uh, the role of Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia um, you know, the way that that has contributed so far to your journey, what would you like to see us doing um, on an, in an ongoing way and into the future? Um, we want you to feel empowered. We want you to feel informed. You know, we want you to feel supported. So tell us how you're feeling, whether that's happening for you. And if it's not, what could be done better from both from Neuroendocrine Cancer Australia, but also really, you know, in terms of the government and the way the funds are allocated, the way that services are provided, how could that all improve to sort of suit your needs? Your needs. It's time for coffee. Suit your needs better. Um, so uh, there will be information in the notes about how to um, provide a submission. You can do it via writing or via email, or via video, if you would like. So if you wanted to sit there with your phone and um, record us a video, we would love that. Um, and yeah, we're really keen to hear your responses. I think we've had about six. So we could do with a few more. I mean, obviously, if we get hundreds, we might spend a bit of time watching them and sifting out which ones we send to the government. But um, we're really keen to get some get some useful feedback from you about that. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Uh, next week, we are talking about, I think uh, it's just me next week on Facebook Friday. And I think it might be time to do another Back to Basics um, video because they seem to be um, quite, um, quite, important helpful for people so my question to you is well what's the next basic i think we've talked about what are neuroendocrine cancers we've talked about um uh, carcinoid syndrome um so that you know the hormonal um output of, of of those hormones so what other things would you you know what is in your nets 101 what else would have been really important to see a, a trying to be concise video um with a basic 101 um, is it about somatostatin analogs or is that a bit too detailed for a back to basics video? Um, is it about, I don't know, I'm going to leave it with you because I'm running out of words and ideas and I need to have a cuppa and so do you. I'm going to finish there. So thanks everybody for joining me. It's been lovely. Um, I'm sure it's been great for you to have John along. Certainly I learned heaps, which was fantastic too. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you next week and yeah, stay safe, take care. Um, I'm going to attempt to find the NVIDIA button and I'll see you next week. Take care.